section one of the pilgrimage of etheria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the pilgrimage of etheria by etheria introduction the narrative and its authorship this book was discovered by signor garmarini in a manuscript of the eleventh century at arezzo and he published it first in eighteen eighty seven and again in a corrector edition in eighteen eighty eight three years later an english translation with text and notes by dr j h bernard and an appendix on the topography by sir c w wilson appeared under the auspices of the palestine pilgrims text society in eighteen ninety five dom cabral issued a treatise of some importance entitled les églises de jerusalem then came m paul gaillet's edition in eighteen ninety eight in volume thirty four of the vienna corpus script ecle latine who still further amended and elucidated the text up till that time signor gamarini's conjecture that the authoress was sylvia of aquitaine sister of the emperor theodosius minister rufinus had been considered plausible but had not been either corroborated or disproved but in nineteen o three dom ferretin revue des questions historiques volume seventy four sought to identify her with the virgin named etheria mentioned by valerius in a letter to the religious brethren of the virzo in northwest spain and his arguments have met with very general acceptance in nineteen o nine however a detailed and determined attack upon his views was made by karl meister in the rheinisches museum so far as the date and nationality of the pilgrim are concerned but his arguments were in monseigneur duquesne's opinion successfully met and answered by the abbe de conic revue biblique nineteen ten and others no one probably now adheres to the theory that sylvia was the pilgrim meister himself agrees with the other scholars already mentioned who have identified her with the abbess named etheria to whom valerius refers he only disputes her date and nationality dom ferretin's theory amounting almost to a certainty was that she was a fellow countrywoman of valerius who had visited the east towards the end of the fourth century i e in the reign of theodosius died three ninety five valerius himself lived in the second half of the seventh century and is chiefly known as the biographer of his contemporary saint fructusius bishop of braga he was abbot of the monasterium rufianesens near astorga in the mountainous district of galicia now called the verzo in the letter mentioned above he speaks of etheria as extremo exedui maris oceani litori exorta sprung from the farthest shores of the western sea the ocean chapter four while a doubtful phrase where the true reading is uncertain in chapter one seems nevertheless almost necessarily to connect etheria with the extremitas vis octidia plaga the farthest part of this western coast if huis occurred in the first of these two expressions the inference that she was from galicia would be certain as it is the phrases are so similar that very little doubt can be entertained that she was meister however maintains that they do not of necessity indicate this district and that inter alia as her language exhibits no trace of the spanish dialect but distinct traces of that of gallia narbonensis and as she refers to the river rhone on page thirty one as if it were familiar both to herself and her readers she came from south-east gaul and that her monastery was perhaps at marseilles or arles where there were well-known religious houses in the sixth century to which he assigns her pilgrimage viz in the first half of the reign of justinian died five sixty five a considerable portion of meister's argument rests upon the language used by etheria he goes into minute details over her usages and the upshot of his examination is that she was not unlearned but was familiar with the scriptures to the language of which her own is similar her phrases being often suggested by or formed from the same this seems to him to point to a later date and a different nationality than the one we have accepted 
we too do not think she was for her time and country badly educated and unlearned nor unfamiliar with the scriptures no one could think that but making all possible allowances for the inaccuracies of the scribe to whom we owe our knowledge of her narrative and they are probably serious and frequent yet the fact remains that she wrote a very slipshod latin her deficiencies cannot all be due to the carelessness or ignorance of the copyist and this is the more surprising because though she does not appear to have picked up any syriac or other native tongue in her journeys yet she is by no means without knowledge of greek for she uses quite a large number of greek words and phrases and transliterates them as a rule with accuracy see list on page forty eight following besides that she displays great intelligence and exercises great powers of observation and appreciation of what she sees and hears wherever she goes and this makes her narrative always lively and entertaining in spite of the defects in her style and occasional obscurity of meaning stress has been laid and not without reason on the indications of etheria's social importance which her story affords wherever she went she was well received and entertained by bishops clergy and monks who spared no pains in acting as cithoroni to her she was provided with escorts of roman soldiers when passing through a disturbed and dangerous district between sinai and egypt page fourteen but dispensed with their services when it was no longer necessary to trouble them page seventeen though she often uses the first person singular as the head of the pilgrimage yet she no less often speaks of we and us in a way that serves to show that she travelled with a certain retinue of her own while in the journey to mount sinai she was also accompanied by certain holy guides deductores and again when she went to mount nebo the cost of this expedition from west to east and back again which occupied several years must have been great however abundant the hospitality was which she met with in the return from mount sinai to clisma suez she mentions the animals she used these were apparently not camels for she immediately speaks of them by name as used by the natives of paran but for the first part of the ascent of mount nebo east of jordan she was able to use aselus an ass or mule whereas she had to walk all the way up mount sinai not even asela litter being possible because of its great steepness if she had been an ordinary pilgrim in those days she would have been content to go on foot the whole way such considerations again were amongst those which led earlier editors to identify our pilgrim as has been said above with either gala placidia or with sylvia of aquitaine but though there is a certain amount in sylvia's case that fits in with what is here contained yet the terms in which the lausiac history of palladius speaks of her in connection with her journey from jerusalem to egypt show that she was an aesthetic of the most severe type in her practices and that our pilgrim never shows herself to have been however much she respects and admires asceticism in those she meets or visits three other matters remain to be considered which bear upon the dates of the narrative besides being of general interest a etheria speaks of the three bishops whom she came across in mesopotamia at bathne edessa and haran as conspicuous for their holiness being both monk and confessor in each case she does not apply this word confessor to any other of the bishops although she has several times noted that they were or had been monks formerly while the still vigorous old priest whom she saw on mount sinai had been both a monk from an early age and as they say here an ascete according to monseigneur duquesne we know that the three bishops who are called confessors were victims of the persecution under valens a d three sixty seven three seventy eight page five forty seven we can hardly be said to know this but only that this is more likely that they were other things being considered than that they were those whom the emperor anastasius favouring the monophysites drove out in the early years of the sixth century as meister maintains is it however altogether certain that confessor in these three cases means more than a stricter ascete than an ordinary monachus 
duquesne himself recognizes that this is a frequent meaning of the title in those days see christian worship page one forty two one seventy three two eighty four and four twenty and bradesol east du breve rome page fifty seven still eulogius bishop of edessa died three eighty eight seems to have suffered persecution and this would no doubt fit in with our date for the pilgrimage b etheria quotes the bishop of haran's statement to her that at that time the persians held the district of nisibus and ur and the romans had no place there page thirty nine as the emperor jovian had yielded the district to king sapor in three sixty three that seems to be the explanation of the statement on the other hand in the years five forty five forty five the romans under belisarius regained their supremacy in the east so that meister allows that the pilgrimage must have taken place before then for that reason among others he assigns it to five thirty four or thereabouts c dr bernard has drawn our attention to another point in favour of the earlier date which meister seems to have overlooked it is this when we come to the pilgrimages which are admittedly of the sixth century e g the so-called breviarum and the pilgrimage of theodosius both of which may be dated about five thirty we find among the churches in jerusalem visited by pilgrimage st peter in the house of caiaphas and st sophia in the praetorium etheria knows nothing of these she names only the martyrium the anastasis and the church of zion and as her description of the holy city is rich in detail it may be reasonably concluded that these were the only churches which she saw and that her visit was prior to the erection of those named by theodosius meister uses a similar argument to prove that the pilgrimage must be prior to the building by justinian of the church of st mary dipara in five forty three as it certainly was but this reasoning is equally conclusive to establish its priority to the breviarium and the peregrinatio theodosii the present edition and its editors that part of the text which relates to jerusalem had been translated for the english version second edition of duquesne's origines du culte chrétien which mrs mcclure published in nineteen o four for it she was mainly indebted as she tells us to her brother the rev george herbert who had the advantage of many criticisms and suggestions from so eminent a scholar as the late canon charles evans formerly headmaster of king edward's school birmingham mr herbert also translated the rest of the text which now appears with the same assistance moreover he read through k meister's book on the subject and made a careful resume of his conclusions for her of which use has been freely made in this introduction most of the footnotes were added to the text by mrs mcclure herself a few by the present writer but though the results of their joint labors had been set up in print for some time and she had spent a good deal of time in further research and thought over them with a view to writing the introduction she had to lay the work aside while she was completing the fifth edition of christian worship and seeing it through the press this she had hardly done when she was called away just as she was intending to resume her work on the pilgrimage of etheria last summer nineteen eighteen there are many reasons why we mourn her loss and surely among them we must reckon this that we are not now permitted to share with her the joy of seeing the fruits of her long study brought to completion she left very few materials for the introduction behind among her papers and though the present writer has in all cases done his best to utilize what there was and to reproduce what he thought to be in her mind on various points yet he has had very largely to start de novo in drawing up the introductory sections and to treat the text more or less independently he must be forgiven therefore if he has failed sometimes to do justice to her ideas and to the researches on which she had so long been engaged and if there is a certain amount of confusion in arrangement and of discrepancy between her part of the volume and his mrs mcclure had frequently discussed points with friends of considerable expert knowledge like archbishop bernard monseigneur duquesne professor flinders petri and others and sometimes mentions them by name in her notes as having told her this or that 
the first named of these had written a short foreword to the volume in september nineteen sixteen but he has requested the present writer to withdraw it as being no longer suitable to its purpose and to use the additional facts that he there gave in his own introduction this he has been very glad to do and begs to acknowledge his indebtedness to his grace for them as well as to others who have contributed to the production of the book in its present form and in particular to the rev a d rigby who has read through the proofs and made several valuable suggestions which he has been able to adopt etheria's route to and from constantinople we have of course no hint of the route taken by etheria from her home in the extreme west of europe as far as constantinople and back again unless her mention of the river rhone be taken as indicating that she crossed it in her journey possibly at arles but it is interesting to note that nearly fifty years before her the anonymous pilgrim of bordeaux gives the route which she pursued and that may possibly have been etheria's too she went out by land she tells us across the north of italy through noricum pannonia moisi dacia and thrace while on her return she embarked at olan in epirus and crossed the south adriatic to hydruntum otranto and reached home by rome and milan End of section one. Section two of the Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction Resume of her journeyings. The narrative, as we now possess it, opens in the middle of a sentence at the point where the pilgrim had already reached the megalithic remains at Kibroth Atava, in sight of the mountain range of Sinai it may reasonably be assumed that the missing part contained the account of her journey from her western home to constantinople from thence through what is now asia minor to antioch and on to jerusalem the events of her stay there apart from the description of the services which she gives later on at page forty five and following and her journey from thence towards mount sinai by way of clisma now suez and Faran or paran she had just before probably ascended the mountain of Faran, where the hands of moses were uplifted during the battle with amalekat exodus seventeen ten following and came down again into the plain see page twenty two below by this time the mountains lie only four miles distant and passing along the wide flat valley that lies between they soon arrive at their foot on the western side sir c w wilson has no doubt that the peak which she calls the mount of god and made a point of ascending was jebel musa the traditional site seven thousand three hundred and sixty three feet high though it would actually be impossible for her to see what she was told she saw from the top page six like so many tourists she was misinformed she went also to what she was told was mount oreb where elijah's cave was and there she specially mentions the very earnest prayer with which they made the oblation thence they descended on the eastern side to the place of the burning bush where the present convent of st catherine is and after visiting tabara and several other sites she returned down the valley again to faran and so back after two days rest by a toilsome route across the desert to clisma where she was again glad to rest for a while when she had been in egypt before she had seen something of goshen as well as of the Tibad and alexandria but she was now desirous to explore the route of the exodus more carefully she found it was no easy journey of four stations across the desert to what she calls the city of arabia identified by experts with the thou of roman official documents or possibly bubastir and the district was apparently at the time unsettled and in military occupation however she was allowed an escort of soldiers and set out the route lay past apolium 
where there was a roman garrison then through two other forts migdal and baal zephon and onwards by way of etham succoth pithom another fort to heroopolis then only a large village on a branch of the nile and within the borders of egypt the remainder of the journey into goshen was then accomplished it took her past rameses which was only four miles from her goal the city of arabia which she reached on the eve of the epiphany in time for the services here she sent back her military guard as she was now on the high road from the thebaide to pelusium and would have no difficulty when she resumed her journey towards palestine at rameses saft el hene which was once a great city she found nothing but ruins remaining except two great statues cut out of one great theban stone and an ancient sycamore famous for its healing virtue which they called the tree of truth according to the bishop of arabia who had come out to meet her there his account also was that pharaoh had burnt the place to the ground in anger at the israelites escape etheria's route lay for two days right through the land of goshen along the banks of the nile and she was greatly struck with the fertility and beauty of this district in an article by miss amelia betham edwards which appeared in harper's magazine october eighteen eighty six we read the following interesting comments on this this was before the submerging of the field of zoan by lake menzela mazudi the arab traveller and historian of the tenth century thus describes it the place occupied by the lake was formerly a district which had not its equal in egypt for fine air fertility and wealth gardens plantations of palms and other trees vines and cultivated fields met the eye in every direction in short there was not a province in egypt except the fayum to be compared with it for beauty this district was distant about one day's journey from the sea but in the year two fifty one of the era of diocletian a d five thirty five the waters of the sea flowed in and submerged that part of the plain which now is called the lake of tennis and every year the inundation increased so that at last it covered the whole province we know that the late mrs mcclure considered this an additional corroboration of her conviction that meister's date for the pilgrimage was wrong and it is certainly a remarkable sidelight on the narrative if the date and the other statements are to be relied on between the city of arabia and pelusium on the sea-coast she mentions only one place that she passed through viz tatnus which is taken as more likely to be the ancient taphanes or daphno than tanis zoan but the two places were not far apart and the relevancy of the extract just given is not affected without further description of her journey etheria arrived once more in jerusalem she now proceeds to describe another expedition she undertook from there viz to make the ascent of mount nebo in the land of moab this time she was accompanied by several of the clergy and monks they crossed the jordan by jericho and passing through livias came to the mountain and having reached the top were much delighted with the panorama spread before them particulars of which she gives they then returned to the holy city her next tour was through jericho again and then northwards up the jordan valley until they came first to salem where they visited melchizedek's church and city then to ainan thisbe elijah's native place and the brook cherith and so crossing the jordan into the ascetis uz where they made the burying place of job at carneas or deneba the final point of their journey the church had been built by some tribune but left unfinished here again etheria refers to the thankfulness and joy with which she and her companions made their communion at the special oblation which the bishop offered at her request before they returned once more to jerusalem but there is a gap in the manuscript in the middle of the account of this tour after leaving the brook cherith they continued up the valley until they saw on the left towards phoenicia on the northwest a great and very high mountain which extended and there the gap begins and when the story is taken up again we are at job's burial place valerius chapter two mentions several mountains as visited by her which are omitted in our fragments 
Farron, where Moses prayed with hands uplifted, but that no doubt she described before our fragments begin, page one. Tabor, the scene of our Lord's transfiguration, Hermon, where the Lord was wont to rest himself with his disciples, and the mountain where our Lord taught his disciples the Beatitudes, etc. The shape of Tabor, which is conical and not very high, does not suit Etheria's description. One would think, therefore, that it was part of the Hermon range that she saw, and that by the time she saw it, she had returned east to cross the Jordan. The time had now come for Etheria to return to her own country, but still full of energy and desire to see as much as she could, she determined to make a big detour from Antioch, which would lie in her direct course by land to Constantinople, and visit from there several important and interesting places in northwest Syria and Mesopotamia, before turning her face westwards accordingly when she left antioch she went first to hierapolis and from there reached the great river euphrates which she can only compare with the rhone for its width and strong current they crossed it in a ship and came to bethne in azurn and from thence arrived at edessa the chief goal of her desires where she stayed three days and had a busy and very interesting time matters of interest are involved in this portion of the narrative which deserve attention etheria expressly says she went to edessa to pray at the martyrium of st thomas the apostle whose whole body is there and when she arrived there she and her companions went at once to the church and the martyrium of st thomas she found the great and beautiful church had been rebuilt in a new form nova compositione this the emperor valens had finished in three seventy two sacra hist ecle four eighteen her language seems though not at all certainly to imply that the martyrium was still separate from the church the chronicle of edessa says the tomb was transferred to the new church in three ninety four when cyrus was bishop who had succeeded eulogius on his death in three eighty eight this again seems to corroborate the date we have accepted for her pilgrimage she visited many other martyria in the town but makes no specific allusion to the famous likeness of our lord though it is said to have been held in veneration at least as early as the middle of the fourth century she does however describe two other striking likenesses which she was taken to see though that can hardly be more than a coincidence viz the marble busts or images archaeotype of king agbar and his son magnus in the royal palace page thirty three etheria gives us likewise an account that will be read with interest of what she was told about the letters of abgar to our lord and his answer this account differs from that of eusebius ister ecclesia two thirteen in mentioning the promise of christ that no enemy should ever enter the city eusebius knows nothing of such a promise of immunity though later historians relate it see bernard's note page thirty six and it was known to ephraim cyrus about three ninety she also mentions that she had copies of these letters at home meister points out that rufinus's translation of eusebius historia ecclesia into latin was not complete before three ninety eight at the earliest from which he argues that copies would not be known in the west so soon as the date assigned by gamurini and adopted by ourselves but there may have been other sources or authorities greek as well as latin besides eusebius nor was etheria perhaps quite so ignorant of greek as is usually thought and her copies may have been in that language after all from edessa she went on to haran and stayed there two days one of them being april twenty four the festival of st helpidius see note on page thirty seven she would very much have liked to penetrate farther east to nisibis and then on to ur of the chaldees but the bishop dissuaded her on the ground that that district was now in the hands of the persians no longer the romans see page thirty nine she was content therefore to go only six miles out and see the well from which jacob watered rachel's flocks at a place called fadana the padan aram of genesis twenty eight two she then returned to antioch and pursued her westward journey through cilicia till she came to tarsus 
here she made another detour by way of pompeiopolis or soli and coricus both on the sea-coast in order to pay a special visit to the tomb of st thecla in isuria where she met to her great delight her dear friend marthana whom she had known in jerusalem see note on page twenty nine coming back to tarsus she made her way without further delay by mopsacrane which she calls mansocrine and under mount taurus through cappadocia galatia and bithynia until she arrived at chalcedon and stopped there for the famous shrine of st euphemia and finally arrived at constantinople there she visited the church of the apostles page forty four and many other of the martyria with which the city abounded and still indefatigable tells her beloved sisters that while she is preparing this narrative for them there and also it seems drawing up her account of the services and rites which she had witnessed at jerusalem she will not actually leave her home till she has crossed into asia once again and visited the martyrium of st john at ephesus if anything further remains to tell and her life is spared she will relate it in person or in another letter and so she brings her story to an end which investigation proves to be as veracious as it is undoubtedly vivacious throughout end of section two section three of the pilgrimage of etheria by etheria this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction ecclesiastical organization etheria practically gives no description and makes no comment on the church organization of the district through which she journeyed except that she mentions one the bishops and other clergy whom she met often saying that they had been or still were from among the ranks of the monastic orders and two the churches in which they ministered at the end of the fourth century egypt was an independent province under the patriarch of alexandria but the part of egypt she mostly mentions would hardly have been organized by that time into what afterwards became known as augustanica prima with fourteen bishops the chief of whom was at pelusium the bishop of jerusalem had had special privileges granted him at the council of nicaea three twenty five but he was still under the jurisdiction of his provincial metropolitan the bishop of caesarea duquesne opsit page twenty seven and therefore probably the clergy west of the jordan she had to do with outside the holy city were likewise dependent on the latter to the east and northeast of the jordan as far as hieriopolis page thirty one the places she visited were probably all in the domain of the patriarch of antioch while those in mesopotamia would be under the catholicus of armenia the monks and nuns of the narrative it is a matter of common knowledge that monasticism took its rise in egypt about the middle of the third century perhaps as the result of the decian persecution many of those who then fled to the desert never returning and that from the beginning of the fourth century the movement developed mainly along two lines which were almost contemporaneous one under the method of st anthony whose monks were mostly solitary hermits in the strict sense though in some places they lived near one another in small companies and met together for common worship on saturdays and sundays two under the rule of st pacomius who founded the conventual type of monasticism here the brethren lived together in much larger bands and not only combined for common worship but were organized for regular work on the land etc though they took no meals together and were each allowed to practise that amount of austerity which his strength and zeal prompted beyond the fixed minimum which was obligatory on all thus the spirit of individualism was a strongly marked feature in both these systems it was from egypt by way of rome that monasticism was quite early brought to western europe and there for some time it retained many of its more especially eastern characteristics the community of feeling and atmosphere therefore between the monastic institutions of the west and those of egypt syria and palestine was considerable and will account for the readiness with which etheria was received everywhere on her journeys and for the highly appreciative way in which she commends the saintliness of her entertainers and informants who were in the greater number of instances closely associated with the monastic and ascetic life 
the rule of st pacomius which sprang into a full organization almost at once like minerva from the head of jove spread rapidly but into palestine the monastic life was introduced early in the fourth century not by him but by a disciple of st antony hilarion there the original impulse to the eremitic life survived and the cenobitic ideal made little headway either now or later in syria and mesopotamia asceticism was so to speak indigenous consequently most if not all the monks and nuns that etheria met in palestine syria and mesopotamia were probably either of the strictly eremitic or semi-eremitic kind see for example page thirty seven the names she uses to describe these monks and nuns are various in the former part of the narrative her regular name for them is monachi we have already mentioned page thirteen the three instances where she also brings in the word ascites hasketes and the three doubtful instances of the use of the word confessor in connection with monks the ascites whom she heard of or met at carnes on the east of jordan was evidently a solitary and so probably was the priest on mount sinai also the monachus at thisbe it would seem page twenty eight a number of them came into haran from the mesopotamia desert on the feast of st helpidius april twenty four at seleucia in isaria we read for the first time of women virgines as well as men the former under the direction of a deaconess named marthana see page forty two whom she had previously met at jerusalem and also there she first uses the term apotactite which for her includes members of both sexes this term recurs several times at jerusalem where monazontes and parthenae are likewise mentioned monazontes should strictly denote solitaries but so should monarchy probably neither have always their strict significance in Ethereum's vocabulary the term apotactite seems to have been an unusual one for christian ascetics palladius in his lausiac history frequently uses the verb apotactite of those who renounce the pleasures and pursuits of the world and cassian gave his book the title de institutis renuncianeum where renunciantes bears the same sense but otherwise apotoctetes was one of the names assumed by such ascetic heretics as the manichaean encretates etc evidently however in etheria's usage it is more or less equivalent to monarchy monazontes and parthenae virgines and has not the least sinister association one other word which is connected with this subject needs a little explanation etheria constantly speaks of the monks monasteria it follows from what has been said that with her in the singular monasterium means a cell mostly that of a solitary and in the plural monasteria means a collection of cells where monks were living under semi-eremitic conditions more probably under the method of st anthony than under the rule of st pacomius thus the aged priest on mount sinai came out de monasterio zuo page four and the bishop of the city of arabia whom she had known ever since she was in the thebaid had been brought up in a passino from his boyhood in monasterio this man in passing is quite worthy of further notice because etheria tells us that in consequence he was both well learned in the scriptures and chastened in his whole life besides being courteous and most kind in receiving pilgrims truly a charming picture of an old-world church dignitary for instances of monasteria collections of cells we may refer to what is said of them under mount sinai on page five where the monk's successful cultivation of the lower slopes is well described and again to those she visited around rachel's well near haran and the monasteria sine numero vivorum ac mulerium which she found surrounding the church at seleucia these last were all enclosed in a high wall which had been raised to protect them from the inroads of the brigands who infested the district page forty two etheria's use of the bible etheria's usual name for the bible is scriptura 
either in the singular or the plural and with or without the epithet holy twice she uses the expression the scriptures of god page sixteen and forty she characterizes the pentateuch from which she naturally quotes most often as the holy books of holy moses the most interesting of the titles she uses however is on page thirty eight scriptura canonis the scripture of the canon a title which is apparently almost unknown elsewhere westcott canon of the new testament page five o four following doubted whether credner's term graphi canonos had any justification he himself quoted from amphilochius circa three eighty the following as the nearest approach to it readers note long greek phrase and note but now etheria ex hypothesi this writer's contemporary has given us an even more exact equivalent as bishop westcott says canon here must mean the authoritative rule or standard by which the books have been ratified and approved in the church her quotations and references to the books of the old testament usually give a close representation of the greek of the septuagint although we may imagine from her imperfect knowledge of greek that they are based on a pre-vulgate latin version not on the septuagint itself the proper names she quotes are as we have shown in the text good instances of this and to these we may add one which is perhaps the clearest of all on page twenty six her quod dologomor c f genesis fourteen represents almost exactly the septuagint codolomosnov while our english chedolaramor represents the vulgate chodolormor she has however made a slip in calling him king of nations instead of king of elam see note in loco there are a few variations or divergencies which are worthy of note though it is of course doubtful how far they are due to carelessness in her own or her copyist transcription the principal of these are as follows one page eight following exodus three five coridiam colciamenti the latchet of thy shoe here the septuagint only gives hupodime but see genesis fourteen twenty three and st mark one seven which probably account for her version the same reading is found in origen latin works two page nine exodus thirty two twenty seven de porta in porta here we should no doubt read in portam septuagint epi pulem as the ablative makes no sense three page fifteen genesis forty seven six etheria's rendering here represents exactly neither the septuagint text nor the vulgate which are different from one another she gives en meliori terra egypti where the septuagint has en te beltitiste gen vulgate in optimo loco and she adds in terra yethsan in terra arabiae which the septuagint omits while the vulgate reads entrade eis terum gesen probably etheria's is meant to be only a loose paraphrase not an exact translation four and five pages eighteen and nineteen for the readings and the explanations of them in deuteronomy thirty two forty nine and thirty four eight see notes in loco six page thirteen in quoting apparently numbers ten twelve and thirty three thirty six she gives this rendering filii israel ambulaveront iter suum to the septuagint exeon and apecon vulgate profecti but she is probably thinking rather of such phrases as poga este or poeste odon than the exact original e g proverbs two twenty epoguanto vulgate ambilas devus agathas three twenty three in apocune vulgate ambulabas tas hodus su and judges seventeen eight two poense hodon seven page six she follows a septuagint version of one kings nineteen nine t su eftutsai quid tu hic 
a reading which is found in tertullian de ienu six eight page thirty six in genesis twenty four twenty etheria takes it for granted as usual that abraham's eldest servant is the same as eleazar of damascus fifteen twenty though it is merely an assumption again on page twenty five it appears that she accepted the identification of the salem of melchizedek genesis fourteen eighteen with the place of that name near sychar not as others do with jerusalem c f jerome ad evangelium paragraph twenty seven and onum her statement on page thirty two that batanis batne is mentioned in the bible is so far as we know without foundation also that moses was born at tafnis or tatnis page seventeen and wrote the book of deuteronomy in the plains of moab page nineteen her actual quotations from the new testament are not very numerous and the following are the only ones that need be commented on one in st mark fourteen thirty eight page seventy two she omits and pray and renders enname by ne vulgate ut non two in st luke twenty two forty one page seventy one readers note extensive greek passage is not accessit the copyist mistake for abscessit if so it is probably a genuine reading of the latin version etheria used three in st john twenty twenty five page eighty three she has non credo nisi videro but the greek is eon me ido u me pistunas no doubt it is a brief paraphrase and not a quotation for in her reference to st john nineteen thirty on page seventy seven she uses the word redidet spiritum to represent pagedomen to numa a much more expressive phrase than the vulgate traditet spiritum was this again the reading of her latin text End of section three Section four of the Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction: The Lives of the Saints. Besides these frequent references to the Bible lessons, which describe the places she visited and the actions of holy men, which are there connected with them, Etheria on page forty-three mentions in set terms the acts of Saint Thecla as having been read by her or to her when she was at Seleucia. Her story, which is closely connected with that of Saint Paul, is referred to by Tertullian de Bapt one hundred seventeen about a d two hundred as well as by hilary of poitiers and jerome in the fourth century the acts of paul and thecla were at one time almost looked upon as included in the canon at edessa also she read besides the usual bible lessons some things concerning st thomas himself page thirty two it is not certain what the reference here is the well-known acts of thomas were a gnostic document not specially connected with edessa nor at all likely to be used by the orthodox etheria the earlier legend made out that st thomas the apostle sent thaddeus to edessa the later version identified the two probably what etheria read was either the doctrina apostolorum or the doctrina ad laia or the greek acta thaddeae so again in connection with what the bishop had quoted for her benefit at haran Cherie, she tells her beloved sisters that her informants were always most careful to quote from and she to listen to only the most reliable stories whether from the scriptures themselves or from the gesta mirabili of holy men i e sete some of whom were dead and some still alive page thirty nine points of liturgical interest one epiphany etheria leaves practically no room for doubt that both in egypt and in jerusalem the feast of the nativity was kept on january sixth not on december twenty five and this is in accordance with what we know to be the general usage of those churches otherwise our christmas day had distinctly a western origin not having been introduced into the east before three seventy five and that was at antioch 
juvenal bishop of jerusalem died 458 is said to have accepted it but cosmas indico Plustes, a native of egypt in the first half of the sixth century distinctly witnesses against its observance in jerusalem then for the vicissitudes in regard to christmas see duquesne opsit page two fifty nine following and conibert rituala arminiorum page five twelve two the purification february fourteen etheria's name for it is simply quadragesima de epiphiana the fortieth day from epiphany the common name for it being hypante hupapante or meeting i e of the holy family with simeon and anna this is the earliest extant notice of it naturally it would begin as a favourite local commemoration in the holy city and thence it spread towards the west in the sixth century three lent at jerusalem lasted eight weeks when etheria was there the forty days or more strictly forty-one days being made up by omitting all the eight sundays and all the saturdays except easter eve this prolongation of the season is not mentioned elsewhere but it may be noted that the retention of the saturday as a festival not in lent only was long general in the east if not to some extent in the west etheria says that in jerusalem they call quadragesima eote i e eante feast but this is probably a mistake on her part due to her imperfect knowledge of greek eote singular being commonly used for the great yearly festival of easter four the observances of holy week are all of great interest in view of the early date of the record they included the following a the children's waving of olive or palm branches on the sunday this again started in jerusalem b the celebration of the communion in the late afternoon of monday thursday for this practice see further below on page thirteen c the adoration of the cross and the observance of the three hours on good friday d king solomon's ring and the ancient anointing horn of the kings were also exhibited and venerated five ascension day itself was kept but without much ceremonial and at bethlehem not in the embomon as one would have expected curiously enough however on the afternoon of pentecost page eighty seven meetings were held both in the aeliona and in the embomon at which the feast of the ascension was again commemorated six the following were the daily offices a vigiliae nocturnae before dawn b matins at dawn c tes only in lent d sext e non f lucernar vespers no mention is made of prime or compline these services were open to all who wished to attend but naturally the chief part of the congregation consisted of ascetics of both sexes monazontes et parthenae page forty five three psalms and three prayers were said at each office and etheria was agreeably impressed with the to her unfamiliar practice of adapting psalms prayers and lessons to the special teaching of the season or place she also speaks of hymns and antiphons being used the practice of singing or saying hymns other than the psalms of david in divine service was of very early origin certainly in the east and almost as certainly in the west so that in any case etheria would not have been entirely unaccustomed to it but in the fourth century largely in consequence of the efforts of the orthodox or catholics to counteract the spread of arian views by this means hymn writing and singing had received a very great impetus and such compositions whether metrical as in the west or merely rhythmical as in the east had become a regular part of public worship throughout christendom thus at constantinople we know that st chrysostom had encouraged their use and at milan st ambrose had himself written hymns for the purpose while at edessa the famous syriac hymns of ephraim belonged to about the same period and were intended as a counterblast to the unsound teaching conveyed by the older songs of bardesanes with regard to the antiphons which etheria mentions it is difficult to say whether she means compositions strictly so called because they were sung antiphonally or in a more general sense anthems as we call them for both kinds were already probably in use 
it is not necessary to repeat here what mrs mcclure has said in her footnotes on page forty six by way of possible explanation of the obscure expression to approach the bishop's hand which occurs frequently in etheria's account of the services at jerusalem with regard to etheria's use of the word misa in her narratives it must be remembered that it still has for her its original meaning of dismissal and is so rendered in this translation it does not seem to have been introduced into church phraseology much before the end of the fourth century and she herself does not employ it till she begins to describe the services at jerusalem page forty six following there she applies it to all kinds of meetings for public worship and much more often to the daily or occasional offices than to the liturgy properly so called where however she is careful to distinguish between the misa catechumenorum and the misa fidelium her usual terms for the eucharist are oblatio and offere and the congregation is usually said procedere for its celebration one quite new feature of this edition on which mrs mcclure had spent much care is the use that she has made in her notes of the old armenian lectionary for the purpose of identifying the psalms and lections sung or said at jerusalem during her visit this evidence says archbishop bernard supplies an interesting confirmation of the accuracy of etheria's observations as to the nature of the services at which she was present for the frequent references in its rubrics to jerusalem sites are shown to be genuine and to belong to an early period by the statements of more than one armenian father in the first half of the eighth century the information will be found set out in full in mr conneby's ritual of armenorum page five o seven following it is based upon two manuscripts one at paris in the bibliothèque nationale of the eighth century the other at oxford in the bodleian of the fourteenth century and upon the commentary of gregory Asherani, early eighth century seven fasting various details are given in particular with regard to wednesdays and fridays in lent page fifty nine and the extra strict fast of the apotactity page sixty one but the rules are not always quite clear owing to etheria's use of misa dismissal for other services than the eucharist as the length of the fast depends on the hour of communion she speaks also of the fast after pentecost page eighty nine which as late as the tenth century was still in theory to be observed in western christendom c dowden church year and calendar page eighty five following we find references to it in st athanasius apologia de fuga six and in the apostolic constitutions volume twenty it is perhaps more than a coincidence that one of the ember seasons in the west was fixed by the date of pentecost no relaxation was allowed on account of a martyr's festival falling on a station day in lent at jerusalem c f council of laodicea in phrygia a d three sixty one chapter fifty one eight the eucharist the usual liturgical hour on saturdays and sundays was the third nine a m but on station days throughout the year the ninth three p m once a year on monday thursday see above it was even later i e after the tenth hour four p m this last usage is stated by archbishop bernard opposite page sixty one to have been after a meal in conformity with that of the african church council of carthage a d three ninety seven chapter twenty nine and st augustine epistle ad januar chapter seven but etheria seems to me very distinctly to state that they took their food after not before page seventy one otherwise during lent the liturgy was celebrated only on saturdays and sundays and not on wednesdays and fridays it is interesting to note that the language employed in service time was greek not syriac though interpretations of lessons and instructions were given in syriac for the benefit of those who did not know greek page ninety four at the sunday eucharist as many of the priests who were present preached as wished to and the bishop preached last of all the posture of the preacher seems to have been that of sitting as in the jewish synagogue while the congregation stood applause as well as other signs of emotion were often called forth by the reader or speaker page ninety four nine 
the use of incense is mentioned on page forty nine but apparently for fumigation before the liturgy or at all events the anapokai itself begins not actually as part of the ceremonial ten etheria was struck by the use of the kyria lezon as a response by the numerous choir boys standing by during the recitation of the names from the diptychs at vespers page forty seven the evidence goes to show that this formula was not introduced into the west of christendom till the end of the fifth century the third canon of the council of eson 529 speaks of it as having reached provence by way of rome and milan probably it reached spain somewhat later c e bishop a liturgical history page one one six and following eleven holy baptism the course of preparation of those catechumens who became competentes during lent and the baptism itself on easter eve is fully described and likewise the further instructions given to the newly baptized during the ensuing eastertide the descriptions tally in most respects with what may be gathered from st cyril of jerusalem's eighteen catechetical lectures delivered to the competentes and the five on the mysteries delivered to the neophytes in three eighty six twelve the dedication festival see page forty six below thirteen martyr memorials that of st thomas at edessa is mentioned on page thirty two that of st elpidius at haran on page thirty seven of st thecla at seleucia in isoria on page forty two of st euphemia at chalcedon on page forty three and of st john at ephesus on page forty four among the other churches and holy sites etheria visited besides those in the sinai district mention may be made of the church of melchizedek page twenty eight the garden of st john baptist at anon page twenty seven and the grave of job at carneas page twenty nine she gives a full description on page twenty of the scheme of devotions she and her companions used on each occasion the order followed being thus prayer reading psalm prayer for less full accounts see page seven following twenty one following twenty six following thirty two thirty five following forty and forty three fourteen officers of the church except marthana the deaconess page forty two who had been at jerusalem and was afterwards in charge of nuns at seleucia the only one who needs to be specified here is the archdeacon he is four times mentioned at jerusalem as lifting his voice to announce the place of the next service and to invite the congregation to attend pages sixty three sixty five seventy and eighty seven the same official is mentioned as assisting the bishop when he confers minor orders in the statuta ecclesia antiqua these used to be considered as emanating from the fourth council of carthage three ninety eight but they are now usually assigned to the end of the fifth century and held to be of gallican origin duquesne opsit page one thirty two in any case this is probably the earliest reference to the archdeacon in the east he takes a prominent part in the services of the coptic and syrian churches and is ordained to his office with special rites see denzinger rutus orientalium two page ten seventy eighty six and one forty two fifteen eulogiae at various places etheria was presented with these after service e g at sinai page five where she explains them to be gifts of the fruits grown on the mountain and at nebo on page twenty one and out of the garden or orchard of st john the baptist on page twenty eight see explanation and footnotes in loco of this which can hardly be considered a liturgical matter in the form in which etheria mentions it the churches in jerusalem and the neighbourhood in the holy city itself etheria mentions or refers to these church buildings one the old cathedral church on mount zion which in her day was no longer regularly used for service the congregation however went there her expression is proceditur or itur on wednesdays and fridays in lent on easter day and its octave and on whit sunday two the anastasis resurrection on the traditional site of the holy sepulchre three the sanctuary of the cross on the traditional site of golgotha where the wood of the true cross etc were kept this consisted of two parts a ante crucem 
an open court atrium locus subdivanus with cloisters and b post crucem a smaller roofed-in building for the martyrium ecclesia maior which was also post crucem but exactly where in relation to three b is not quite clear see conjectural plan on page one thirty seven of bernard's edition the great doors valve maiores of it opened on to the market-place de quintana parte these last three buildings were set up by the emperor constantine in three thirty seven the same year in which the church of the apostles mentioned by etheria page forty four had been completed by him in constantinople he also built the baptistry near the anastasis referred to on page seventy nine the bishop's house page fifty was probably close by this group of buildings no longer on mount zion the eight-day dedication festival of the anastasis and the martyrium was held in september in close connection with the discovery of the cross and its exaltation at the same time of the year and on the analogy of the dedication of solomon's temple at the autumn feast of tabernacles a very large concourse assembled in jerusalem on this occasion not only of monks from mesopotamia syria and egypt especially the Thebaid, but also of bishops and clergy and the faithful laity and the churches were decked out as at easter and epiphany see pages ninety five following in the environs of jerusalem she mentions one the church at bethlehem built and adorned by constantine with the help of his mother helena page fifty four this was the appointed place for the night of the epiphany and for the ascension festival two the church eleona on the mount of olives where was the cave in which our lord used to teach his disciples three the embomon the traditional site of the ascension which was higher up on the mount it seems to have been rather an enclosed site with seats than a regular church see page sixty six four the graceful church in gethsemane which was no doubt lower down than eleona page seventy one five the church on the road to bethany where mary lazarus sister met our lord page sixty three six the lazarium in bethany itself no particulars are to hand of these buildings that the present writer is aware of end of section four Section five of the Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Text: The Approach to Sinai. Dot 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 dot. Were pointed out according to the scriptures. In the meanwhile, we came on foot to a certain place where the mountains through which we were journeying opened out and formed an infinitely great valley, quite flat and extraordinarily beautiful, and across the valley appeared Sinai, the holy mountain of God, and this place where the mountains opened out lies next to the place where are the graves of lust. Now, on reaching that spot, the holy guides who were with us told us, saying, The custom is that prayer should be made by those who arrive here, when from this place the mount of God is first seen. And this we did. The whole distance from that place to the mount of God was about four miles across the aforesaid great valley. For that valley is indeed very great, lying under the slope of the mount of God, and measuring, as far as we could judge by our sight, or, as they told us, about sixteen miles in length, but they called its breadth four miles. We had, therefore, to cross that valley in order to reach the mountain. Now this is the great and flat valley wherein the children of Israel waited during those days when holy Moses went up into the mount of the Lord, and remained there forty days and forty nights this moreover is the valley in which the calf was made and the spot is shown to this day for a great stone stands fixed there on the very site this also is the same valley at the head of which is the place where while holy moses was feeding his father-in-law's flocks god spake to him twice out of the burning bush and as our route was first to ascend the mount of god which is in sight here because the ascent was easier by the way we were coming and then to descend to the head of the valley where the bush was that being the easier descent 
so we determined having first seen all that we desired to descend from the mount of god so as to arrive at the place of the bush and thence to return on our journey throughout the whole length of the valley together with the men of god who there showed us each place which is mentioned in the scriptures and so it was done thus going from that spot where we had prayed when we arrived from faran our route was to cross the middle of the head of that valley and so turn to the mount of god now the whole mountain group looks as if it were a single peak but as you enter the group you see that there are more than one the whole group however is called the mount of god but that special peak which is crowned by the place where as it is written the glory of god descended is in the centre of them all and though all the peaks in the group attain such a height as i think i never saw before yet the central one on which the glory of god came down is so much higher than them all that when we had ascended it all those mountains which we had thought to be high were so much beneath us as if they were quite little hills this is certainly very wonderful and not i think without the favour of god that while the central height which is especially called sinai on which the glory of the lord descended is higher than all the rest yet it cannot be seen until you reach its very foot though before you go up it but after that you have fulfilled your desire and descend you can see it from the other side which you cannot do before you begin to ascend this i had learned from information given by the brethren before we had arrived at the mount of god and after i arrived i saw that it was manifestly so the ascent of sinai we reached the mountain late on the sabbath and arrived at a certain monastery the monks who dwelt there received us very kindly showing us every kindness there is also a church and a priest there we stayed there that night and early on the lord's day together with the priest and the monks who dwelt there we began the ascent of the mountains one by one these mountains are ascended with infinite toil for you cannot go up gently by a spiral track as we say snail shell wise but you climb straight up the whole way as if up a wall and you must come straight down each mountain until you reach the very foot of the middle one which is specially called Sinai by this way then at the bidding of christ our god and helped by the prayers of the holy men who accompanied us we arrived at the fourth hour at the summit of sinai the holy mountain of god where the law was given that is at the place where the glory of the lord descended on the day when the mountain smoked thus the toil was great for i had to go up on foot the ascent being impossible in the saddle and yet i did not feel the toil on the side of the ascent i say i did not feel the toil because i realized that the desire which i had was being fulfilled at god's bidding in that place there is now a church not great in size for the place itself that is the summit of the mountain is not very great nevertheless the church itself is great in grace when therefore at god's bidding we had arrived at the summit and had reached the door of the church lo the priest who was appointed to the church came from his cell and met us a hale old man a monk from early life and an ascetic as they say here in short one worthy to be in that place the other priests also met us together with all the monks who dwelt on the mountain that is such as were not hindered by age or infirmity no one however dwells on the very summit of the central mountain there is nothing there excepting only the church and the cave where holy moses was when the whole passage from the book of moses had been read in that place and when the oblation had been duly made at which we communicated and as we were coming out of the church the priests of the place gave us eulogiae that is of fruits which grow on the mountain for although the holy mountain Sinai is rocky throughout so that it has not even a shrub on it yet down below near the foot of the mountain around either the central height or those which encircle it there is a little plot of ground where the holy monks diligently plant little trees and orchards and set up oratories with cells near to them so that they may gather fruits which they have evidently cultivated with their own hands from the soil of the very mountain itself 
so after we had communicated and the holy men had given us eulogiae and we had come out of the door of the church i began to ask them to show us the several sites thereupon the holy men immediately deigned to show us the various places they showed us the cave where holy moses was when he had gone up again into the mount of god that he might receive the second tables after he had broken the former ones when the people sinned they also deigned to show us the other sites which we desired to see and those which they themselves well knew but i would have you to know ladies reverend sisters that from the place where we were standing round outside the walls of the church that is from the summit of the central mountain those mountains which we could scarcely climb at first seemed to be so much below us when compared with the central one on which we were standing that they appeared to be little hills although they were so very great that i thought that i had never seen higher except that this central one excelled them by far from thence we saw egypt and palestine and the red sea and the parthenian sea which leads to alexandria and the boundless territories of the saracens all so much below us as to be scarcely credible but the holy men pointed out each one of them to us oreb having then fulfilled all the desire with which we had hastened to ascend we began our descent from the summit of the mount of god which we had ascended to another mountain joined to it which is called oreb where there is a church this is that oreb where was holy elijah the prophet when he fled from the face of ahab the king and where god spake to him and said what dost thou hear elijah as it is written in the books of the kings the cave where holy elijah lay hid is shown to this day before the door of the church which is there a stone altar also is shown which holy elijah raised to make an offering to god thus the holy men deigned to show us each place there too we made the oblation with very earnest prayer and also read the passage from the book of the kings for it was our special custom that when we had arrived at those places which i had desired to visit the appropriate passage from the book should always be read the oblation having been made there we came to another place not far off which the priests and monks pointed out to us where holy aaron had stood with the seventy elders when holy moses was receiving the law from the lord for the children of israel in that place although it is not covered in there is a great rock which has a flat surface rounded in shape on which those holy men are said to have stood there is also in the midst of it a kind of altar made of stones the passage from the book of moses was read there and one psalm suitable to the place then after prayer had been made we descended thence the bush and now it began to be about the eighth hour and there were still three miles left before we could get out of the mountains which we had entered late on the previous day we had not however to go out on the same side by which we had entered as i said above because it was necessary that we should walk past and see all the holy places and the cells that were there and thus come out at the head of the valley as i said above that is of the valley that lies under the mount of god it was necessary for us to come out at the head of the valley because there were very many cells of holy men there and a church in the place where the bush is which same bush is alive to this day and throws out shoots so having made the whole descent of the mount of god we arrived at the bush about the tenth hour this is that bush which i mentioned above out of which the lord spake in the fire to moses and the same is situated at that spot at the head of the valley where there are many cells and a church there is a very pleasant garden in front of the church containing excellent and abundant water and the bush itself is in this garden the spot is also shown hard by where holy moses stood when god said to him loose the latchet of thy shoe and the rest now it was about the tenth hour when we had arrived at the place and so as it was late we could not make the oblation but prayer was made in the church and also at the bush in the garden and the passage from the book of moses was read according to custom 
then as it was late we took a meal with the holy men at a place in the garden before the bush we stayed there also and next day rising very early we asked the priests that the oblation should be made there which was done the sights in the valley and the return to faran and as our route lay through the middle and along the length of the valley the same valley as i said above where the children of israel sojourned while moses ascended into the mount of god and descended thence so the holy men showed us each place that we came to in the whole valley at the top of the head of the valley where we had stayed and had seen the bush out of which god spake in the fire to holy moses we had seen also the spot in which holy moses had stood before the bush when god said to him loose the latchet of thy shoe for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground in like manner they began to show us the other sights when we set out from the bush they showed us the place where the camps of the children of israel were in those days when moses was in the mount they also showed us the place where the calf was made for a great stone is there to this day fixed on the very spot then too as we were going on the other side we saw the top of the mountain which overlooks the whole valley from which place holy moses saw the children of israel engaged in dancing at the time when they had made the calf they showed us a great rock in the place where holy moses as he was descending with joshua the son of nun in his anger brake the tables that he was carrying on the same rock they showed us where they all had their dwelling-places in the valley the foundations of which dwelling-places appear to this day round in form and made with stone they showed us also the place where holy moses when he returned from the mount bade the children of israel run from gate to gate they showed us also the place where the calf which aaron had made for them was burnt at holy moses bidding they showed us also the stream of which holy moses made the children of israel drink as it is written in exodus they showed us also the place where the seventy men received of the spirit that was upon moses they showed us also the place where the children of israel lusted for meat they showed us also the place which is called a burning because part of the camp was consumed what time holy moses prayed and the fire ceased they showed us also the place where it rained manna and quails upon them thus were shown to us the sites of all the events which in the sacred books of moses are recorded to have occurred there viz in the valley which as i have said lies under the mount of god holy sinai now it would be too much to write of all these things one by one for so great a number could not be remembered but when your affection shall read the holy books of moses it will more quickly recognize the things that were done in that place moreover this is the valley where the passover was celebrated when one year had been fulfilled after that the children of israel were come out of the land of egypt for the children of israel abode in that valley for some time that is while holy moses ascended into and descended from the mount of god the first and the second time they tarried there also while the tabernacle was being made together with all things that were shown to moses in the mount of god the place also was shown to us where the tabernacle was set up by moses for the first time and all things were finished which god had bidden moses in the mount that they should be made at the very end of the valley we saw the graves of lust at the place where we resumed our route that is where leaving the great valley we re-entered the place by which we had come between the mountains of which i spoke above on the same day we came up with the other very holy monks who through age or infirmity were unable to meet us in the mount of god for the making of the oblation who yet deigned to receive us very kindly when we reached their cells so now that together with the holy men who dwelt there we had seen all the holy places we desired as well as all the places which the children of israel had touched in going to and from the mount of god we returned to pharaoh in the name of god and although i ought always to give thanks to god in all things not to speak of these so great favours which he has deigned to confer on me unworthy as i am that i should journey through all these places although i deserved it not 
yet i cannot sufficiently thank even all those holy men who deigned with willing mind to receive my littleness in their cells and to guide me surely through all the places which i was always seeking according to the holy scriptures moreover many of these holy men who dwelt on or around the mount of god deigned to escort us back to ferran but these were of greater bodily strength End of section 5section six of the pilgrimage of etheria by etheria this librivox recording is in the public domain faron to clisma now when we had arrived at faron which is thirty-five miles distant from the mount of god we were obliged to stay there for two days to rest ourselves on the third day hastening thence we came to a station in the desert of faron where we had stayed on our outward journey as i said above on the next day we came to water and travelling for a little while among the mountains we arrived at a station which was on the sea at the place where the route leaves the mountains and begins to run continuously by the sea it runs by the sea in such a manner that at one time the waves touch the feet of the animals while at another the course is through the desert a hundred two hundred and sometimes even more than five hundred paces from the sea for there is no sort of a road there the whole being sandy desert the inhabitants of faron who are accustomed to travel there with their camels put signs in different places and make for these signs when they travel in the daytime but the camels mark the signs at night in short the inhabitants of faron travel more quickly and safely by night in that place being accustomed there too than other men can travel in places where there is a clear road thus on our return journey we emerged from the mountains at the place where we entered them on our journey out and so turned towards the sea so also did the children of israel return from sinai the mount of god to this place by the way they had come that is to the place where we left the mountains and reached the red sea but while we turned back from this spot along the route by which we had made our journey out the children of israel marched hence on their own way as it is written in the books of holy moses so we returned to clisma by the same route and the same stations by which we had come out and when we had arrived at clisma we were obliged to stay there also for rest because we had travelled hard along the sandy way of the desert clisma to the city of arabia now although i had been acquainted with the land of goshen ever since i was in egypt for the first time yet i visited it again in order that i might see all the places which the children of israel touched on their journey out from rameses until they reached the red sea at the place which is now called clisma from the fort which is there i desired therefore that we should go from clisma to the land of goshen that is the city called arabia which city is in the land of goshen the whole territory is called after the city the land of arabia the land of goshen although it is part of egypt it is much better land than all the rest of egypt from clisma that is from the red sea there are four desert stations but though in the desert yet there are military quarters at the stations with soldiers and officers who always escorted us from fort to fort on that journey the holy men who were with us clergy and monks showed us all the places which i was always seeking in accordance with the scriptures some of these were on the left some on the right of our path some were far distant from and some near to our route for i hope that your affection will believe me when i say that as far as i could see the children of israel marched in such wise that as far as they went to the right so far did they turn back to the left as far as they went forward so far did they return backward journeying thus until they reached the red sea apollyon was shown to us from the opposite side when we were at migdal where there is now a fort with an officer set over soldiers to maintain roman discipline these escorted us thence according to custom to another fort and baal zephron was shown to us when we were at that place it is a plain above the red sea along the side of the mountain which i mentioned above where the children of israel cried out when they saw the egyptians coming after them 
etham also was shown to us which is on the edge of the wilderness as it is written also sucketh which is a slight elevation in the middle of a valley and by this little hill the children of israel encamped this is the place where the law of the passover was received the city of pithom which the children of israel built was shown to us on the same journey at the place where leaving the lands of the saracens we entered the territory of egypt the same pithom is now a fort the city of hero which existed at the time when joseph met his father jacob as he came as it is written in the book of genesis is now a come though a large one a village as we say this village has a church and martyr memorials and many cells of holy monks so that we had to alight to see each of them in accordance with the custom which we had the village is now called hero it is situated at the sixteenth milestone from the land of goshen and it is within the boundaries of egypt moreover it is a very pleasant spot for an arm of the nile flows there then leaving hero we came to the city which is called arabia situated in the land of goshen for it is written concerning it that pharaoh said to joseph in the best of the land of egypt make thy father and brethren to dwell in the land of goshen in the land of arabia rameses rameses is four miles from the city of arabia and in order to arrive at the station of arabia we passed through the midst of rameses the city of rameses is now open country without a single habitation but it is certainly traceable since it was great in circumference and contained many buildings for its ruins appear to this day in great numbers just as they fell there is nothing there now except one great theban stone on which are carved two statues of great size which they say are those of the holy men moses and aaron raised in their honour by the children of israel there is also a sycamore tree which is said to have been planted by the patriarchs it is certainly very old and therefore very small though it still bears fruit and all who have any indisposition go there and pluck off twigs and it benefits them this we learn from information given by the holy bishop of arabia who himself told us the name of the tree in greek dendros alethia or as we say the tree of truth this holy bishop deigned to meet us at rameses he is an elderly man truly pious from the time he became a monk courteous most kind in receiving pilgrims and very learned in the scriptures of god he after deigning to give himself the trouble of meeting us showed us everything there and told us about the aforesaid statues as well as about the sycamore tree this holy bishop also informed us how pharaoh when he saw that the children of israel had escaped him before he set out after them went with all his army into rameses and burnt the whole city which was very great and then set out thence in pursuit of the children of israel epiphany at the city of arabia return to jerusalem now it fell out by a very happy chance that the day on which we came to the station of arabia was the eve of the most blessed day of the epiphany and the vigils were to be kept in the church on the same day wherefore the holy bishop detained us there for some two days a holy man and truly a man of god well known to me from the time when i had been in the Tebad he became a holy bishop after being a monk for he was brought up from a child in a cell for which reason he is so learned in the scriptures and chastened in his whole life as i said above from this place we sent back the soldiers who according to roman discipline had given us the help of their escort as long as we had walked through suspected places now however as the public road which passed by the city of arabia and leads from the tebad to pelusium ran through egypt there was no need to trouble the soldiers further setting out thence we pursued our journey continuously through the land of goshen among vines that yield wine and vines that yield balsam among orchards highly cultivated fields and very pleasant gardens our whole route lying along the bank of the river nile among oft-recurring estates which were once the homesteads of the children of israel 
and why should i say more for i think that i have never seen a more beautiful country than the land of goshen and travelling thus for two days from the city of arabia through the land of goshen continuously we arrived at tatnis the city where holy moses was born this city of tatnis was once pharaoh's metropolis now although i had already known these places as i said above when i had been at alexandria and in the Thebaid, yet i wished to learn thoroughly all the places through which the children of israel marched on their journey from rameses to sinai the holy mountain of god this made it necessary to return to the land of goshen and thence to tatnis we set out from tatnis and walking along the route that was already known to me i came to pelusium thence i set out again and journeying through all those stations in egypt through which we had travelled before i arrived at the boundary of palestine thence in the name of christ our god i passed through several stations in palestine and returned to aelia that is jerusalem visit to the jordan valley having spent some time there at god's bidding my will was to go as far as arabia to mount nebo where god commanded moses to go up saying to him get thee up into the mountain arabat into mount nebo which is in the land of moab which is over against jericho and behold the land of canaan which i give unto the children of israel for a possession and die in the mount whither thou goest up so jesus our god who will not forsake them that hope in him deigned to give effect to this my wish wherefore setting out from jerusalem and journeying with holy men with a priest and deacons from jerusalem and with certain brothers that is monks we came to that spot on the jordan where the children of israel had crossed when holy joshua the son of nun had led them over jordan as it is written in the book of joshua the son of nun the place where the children of reuben and of gad and the half-tribe of manasseh had made an altar was shown us a little higher up on that side of the river bank where jericho is crossing the river we came to a city called divius which is in the plain where the children of israel encamped at that time for the foundations of the camp of the children of israel and of their dwellings where they abode appear there to this day the plain is a very great one lying under the mountains of arabia above the jordan it is the place of which it is written and the children of israel wept for moses in the arab at moab on the jordan over against jericho forty days this is the place where after moses death joshua the son of nun was straightway filled with the spirit of wisdom for moses had laid his hands upon him as it is written this is the place where moses wrote the book of deuteronomy and where he spake in the ears of all the congregation of israel the words of this song until it was ended it is written in the book of deuteronomy here holy moses the man of god blessed the children of israel one by one in order before his death so when we had arrived at this plain we went to the very spot and prayer was made here too a certain part of deuteronomy was read as well as his song with the blessings which he pronounced over the children of israel after the reading prayer was made a second time and giving thanks to god we moved on thence for it was always customary with us that whenever we succeeded in reaching the places we desired to visit prayer should first be made there then the lection should be read from the book then one appropriate psalm should be said then prayer should be made again at god's bidding we always kept to this custom whenever we were able to come to the places we desired after this that the work begun should be accomplished we began to hasten in order to reach mount nebo as we went the priest of the place i e livius whom we had prayed to accompany us from the station because he knew the place as well advised us saying if you wish to see the water which flows from the rock which moses gave to the children of israel when they were thirsty you can see it if you are willing to undertake the labor of going about six miles out of the way when he had said this we very eagerly wished to go and turning at once out of our way we followed the priest who led us 
in that place there is a little church under a mountain not nebo but another height behind not yet far from nebo many truly holy monks dwell there whom they call here ascetics these holy monks deigned to receive us very kindly and permitted us to go in to greet them when we had entered and prayer had been made with them they deigned to give us eulogiae which they are wont to give to those whom they receive kindly there in the midst between the church and the cells there flows from out of the rock a great stream of water very beautiful and limpid and excellent to the taste then we asked those holy monks who dwelt there what was this water of so good a flavour and they said this is the water which holy moses gave to the children of israel in this desert so prayer was made there according to custom the lection was read from the books of moses and one psalm said then with the holy clergy and monks who had come with us we went out to the mountain many of the holy monks also who dwelt by that water and who could undertake the labour deigned to ascend mount nebo with us so setting out thence we arrived at the foot of mount nebo which was very high nevertheless the greater part could be ascended sitting on asses though a little bit was steeper and had to be climbed laboriously on foot which was done End of section six. Section 7 of The Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mount Nebo. We arrived then at the summit of the mountain, where there is now a church of no great size, on the very top of Mount Nebo. Inside the church, in the place where the pulpit is, I saw a place a little raised, containing about as much space as tombs usually contain. I asked the holy men what this was, and they answered, here was holy moses laid by the angels for as it is written no man knoweth of his burial since it is certain that he was buried by the angels his tomb indeed where he was laid is not shown to this day for as it was shown to us by our ancestors who dwelt here where he was laid so do we show it to you and our ancestors said that this tradition was handed down to them by their own ancestors so prayer was made anon and all things that we were accustomed to do in their order in every place were done here also and we began to go out of the church then they who knew the place the priests and the holy monks said to us if you wish to see the places that are mentioned in the books of moses come out of the door of the church and from the very summit from the side on which they are visible from here look and see and we will tell you each place that is visible from thence then we rejoiced greatly and immediately came out from the door of the church we saw the place where the jordan runs into the dead sea which place appeared below us as we stood on the opposite side we saw not only livias which was on the near side of jordan but also jericho which was beyond jordan to so great a height rose the lofty place where we stood before the door of the church the greatest part of palestine the land of promise was in sight together with the whole land of jordan as far as it could be seen with our eyes on the left side we saw all the lands of the sodomites and Segor, which is the only one of the five cities that exists to-day there is a memorial of it but nothing appears of those other cities but a heap of ruins just as they were turned into ashes the place where was the inscription concerning lot's wife was shown to us which place is read of in the scriptures but believe me reverend ladies the pillar itself cannot be seen only the place is shown the pillar is said to have been covered by the dead sea certainly when we saw the place we saw no pillar i cannot therefore deceive you in this the bishop of the place that is of sigor told us that it is now some years since the pillar could be seen the spot where the pillar stood is about six miles from sigor and the water now covers the whole of this space then we went to the right side of the church out of doors and opposite to us two cities were pointed out the one is Sibon, now called Exibon, which belonged to Sion, king of the Amorites, and the other, now called Sazdra, the city of Og, the king of Basan. 
fogor which was a city of the kingdom of edom was also pointed out from thence opposite to us all these cities which we saw were situated on mountains but a little below them the ground seemed to be flatter then we were told that in the days when holy moses and the children of israel had fought against those cities they had encamped there and indeed the signs of a camp were visible there from the side of the mountain which i have called the left which was over the dead sea a very sharp cut mountain was shown to us which was formerly called agri specula this is the mountain on which balak the son of baor placed balaam the soothsayer to curse the children of israel and god refused to permit it as it is written then having seen everything that we desired we returned in the name of god through jericho back to jerusalem along the whole of the route by which we had come visit to alsatis now after some time i wished to go to the region of alsatis to visit the tomb of holy job for the sake of prayer for i used to see many holy monks coming thence to jerusalem to visit the holy places for the sake of prayer who giving information of everything concerning those places increased my desire to undertake the toil of going to them also if indeed that can be called toil by which a man sees his desire to be fulfilled so i set out from jerusalem with the holy men who deigned to give me their company on my journey they themselves also going for the sake of prayer making my journey from jerusalem through eight stations to carneas the city of job is now called carneas but it was formerly called denaba in the land of alcetas on the confines of idumea and arabia travelling on this journey i saw on the bank of the river jordan a very beautiful and pleasant valley abounding in vines and trees for such excellent water was there and in that valley there was a large village which is now called sedima the village which is situated in the middle of the level ground has in its midst a little hill of no great size shaped as large tombs are wont to be there is a church on the summit and down below around the little hill great and ancient foundations appear while in the village itself some grave mounds still remain when i saw this pleasant place i asked what it was and it was told me this is the city of king melchizedek which was called salem but now through the corruption of the language the village is called sedima on the top of the little hill which is situated in the midst of the village the building that you see is a church which is now called in the greek language opu melchizedek for this is the place where melchizedek offered pure sacrifices that is bread and wine to god as it is written of him the city of melchizedek directly i heard this we alighted from our beasts and lo the holy priest of the place and the clergy deigned to meet us and straightway receiving us led us up to the church when we had arrived there prayer was first said according to custom then the passage from the book of holy moses was read then one psalm suitable to the place was said then after prayer made we came down when we had come down the holy priest addressed us he was an elderly man well taught in the scriptures and he had presided over the place from the time he had been a monk to whose life many bishops as we learned afterwards bore great testimony saying that he was worthy to preside over the place where holy melchizedek when abraham was coming to meet him was the first to offer pure sacrifices to god when we had come down from the church as i said above the holy priest said to us behold these foundations which you see around the little hill are those of the palace of king melchizedek for from his time to the present day if any one wishes to build himself a house here and so strikes on these foundations he sometimes finds little fragments of silver and bronze and this way which you see passing between the river jordan and this village is the way by which holy abraham returned to sodom after the slaughter of cheddar larimar king of nations and where holy melchizedek the king of salem met him Enon then because i remembered that it was written that st john had baptized in Enon near to salem i asked him how far off that place was it is near two hundred paces off and if you wish i will now lead you there on foot 
this large and pure stream of water which you see in this village comes from that spring then i began to thank him and to ask him to lead us to the place which was done so we began to go with him on foot through the very pleasant valley until we reached a most pleasant orchard in the midst of which he showed us a spring of excellent and pure water which sent out continuously a good stream the spring had in front of it a sort of pool where it appears that st john the baptist fulfilled his ministry then the holy priest said to us this garden is called nothing else to this day than sippos to agui ioannu in the greek language or as you say in latin or to sancti ioannis many brethren holy monks direct their steps hither from various places that they may wash here so at the spring as in every place prayer was made the proper lection was read and an appropriate psalm was said and everything that it was customary for us to do whenever we came to the holy places we did there also the holy priest also told us that to this day at easter all they who are to be baptized in the village that is in the church which is called opus melchizedek are always baptized in this spring returning early to vespers with the clergy and monks saying psalms and antiphons so that they who have been baptized are led back early from the fountain to the church of holy melchizedek then receiving eulogiae out of the orchard of st john the baptist from the priest as well as from the holy monks who had cells in the same orchard and always giving thanks to god we set out on the way we were going the city of elijah the brook cherith then going for a time through the valley of the jordan on the bank of the river because our route lay that way for a while we suddenly saw the city of the holy prophet elijah that is thesbe whence he had the name of elijah the tishbite there to this day is the cave wherein the holy man sat there too is the tomb of holy getha whose name we read in the books of the judges there too we gave thanks to god according to custom and pursued our journey and as we journeyed that way we saw a very pleasant valley opening towards us on the left it was very large and discharged a very great torrent into the jordan and in that valley we saw the cell of one who is now a brother that is a monk then i as i am very inquisitive began to ask what was this valley where the holy monk had now made himself a cell for i did not think it was without reason then the holy men who were journeying with us and who knew the place said this is the valley of korah where holy elijah the tishbite dwelt in the time of king ahab when there was a famine and at the bidding of god the raven used to bring him food and he drank water of the torrent for this brook which you see running through this valley into jordan is korah wherefore giving thanks to god who deigned to show us everything that we desired unworthy as we were we began to make our journey as on other days and as we journeyed day by day on the left side whence on the opposite side we saw parts of phoenicia there suddenly appeared a great and high mountain which extended in length dot 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 a leaf is torn out burial place of job return to jerusalem dot 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 which holy monk and ascetic after so many years spent in the desert found it necessary to move and to go down to the city of carneas in order to advise the bishop and clergy of that time according as it had been revealed to him that they should dig in that place which had been shown to him which was done and they digging in that place which had been shown to him found a cave which they followed for about a hundred paces when suddenly as they dug a stone tomb came to light and when they had uncovered it they found carved on its lid the name job to this job the church which you see has been built in that place in such a manner that the stone with the body should not be moved but that it should be placed where the body had been found and that the body should lie under the altar that church which was built by some tribune has been unfinished to this day next morning we asked the bishop to make the oblation which he deigned to do and the bishop blessing us we set out 
there too we communicated and always giving thanks to god we returned to jerusalem journeying through each of the stations through which we had passed three years before journey into mesopotamia having spent some time there in the name of god when three full years had passed since i came to jerusalem and having seen all the holy places which i had visited for the sake of prayer my mind was to return to my country i wished however at god's bidding to go to mesopotamia in syria to visit the holy monks who were there in great number and who were said to be of such holy life as could hardly be described and also for the sake of prayer at the memorial of st thomas the apostle where his body is laid entire this is at edessa for jesus our god by a letter which he sent to abgar the king by the hand of ananias the courier promised that he would send st thomas thither after that he himself had ascended into heaven the letter is kept with great reverence at the city of edessa where the memorial is now your affection may believe me that there is no christian who having arrived at the holy places that are at jerusalem does not go on thither for the sake of prayer it is at the twenty-fifth station from jerusalem and since from antioch it is nearer to mesopotamia it was very convenient for me at god's bidding that as i was returning to constantinople and my way lying through antioch i should go thence to mesopotamia this then at god's bidding i did end of section seven